Hi, welcome to Portage County Matters. I'm Patty Dreyer, Portage County Executive. So glad that you joined us here today. Today we have two subjects that we're going to talk about. One of them is groundwater and the other one is justice programs. So it is a really uh, awesome show that you're about to, to participate in with us here today, I promise you. It's really important stuff for Portage County. We can take the lighter side all that we want, but the bottom line is they're two serious subjects. So glad that you could be with us. This is the start of a new year. I can't believe it. We're taping it here in December of 2014. So to look ahead to a whole new 2015 is, is wow, another pinch me moment because there's so much going on in our community and, and in our state and nation that we're all kind of keeping up with here. So again, thank you for joining me. I hear often from you out in the community that you watch the show, those of you that come up and express your gratitude, I appreciate that. I realize we only get one take. I realize that it's not a very easy thing to put this together and certainly not an easy thing for these awesome guests who join me, but uh, so appreciate just the opportunity to get the information out to you because when you're, uh, when you're equipped with information, and then I feel like you can be more engaged in shaping our collective future. So groundwater, as you know, I've talked about it on numerous shows and, um, and you've seen it in the news. You know that we're having listening sessions around the county for about six months of time. We've finished eight listening sessions as of this show out of the 10 sessions that we scheduled. The next session that viewers can attend would be January 13th at 6.30 p.m. till 8 p.m. in the uh, Pineries Room of the Public Library. Oh, wait a minute, that's 6 p.m. at the Pineries Room at the Public Library. There are only two sessions that went to 6 p.m. instead of 6.30, so pardon for that. So downtown, I hope that I get to see you for that session. It's an hour and a half to have uh, a chance to voice your view through that discussion of a larger community uh, group and um, to help shape the future of our groundwater management plan in Portage County. The last plan that we had was uh, published in, 24, uh, in 2004, and we're looking at building the new action strategies for our upcoming plan. If you can't attend that session, you're very welcome, like many people already have, to contact my office, whether it's through email or a phone call or um, um, a letter uh, through the postal service so you can get me some feedback about what are you thinking about related to water what about the future of water what would you like to see for us to think about in shaping the future of caring for this resource that we all depend on in our lives at each of the listening sessions we've gone around the county twice now to each quadrant of the county what what we've been finding is it's about maybe 150 people or so who have attended so far and what we have are are a diversity of water related stories in each part of our county that's one thing I never counted on in setting up these listening sessions it was a, a great opportunity for me along the way to learn a lot about how how diverse our water story is. The water story over in the northeast part of the county is very different from how water works for us or against us, I guess I would say sometimes, in the northwest part of the county. We have situations where uh, there's municipal water issues. We've got situations where there are individuals who can't drink their water at home. And, um, and even with a, a water treatment system, it can't take out enough nitrates to make it safe for drinking. And that's an issue in our county. We've got a vibrant agricultural economy and food processing industry here. And we feed so many people beyond the borders of the state of Wisconsin with the vegetables that we grow here. But at the same time, it's about balancing all of these water uses and water users because we share in the ownership of water in the state of Wisconsin. So please, very very, very important that you help us gather your ideas about water, what's going well with it, what's not going well, and what you would like to see us pay attention to in the way of shaping future uh, ideas about water stewardship. When you go to a listening session, one of the things that you get is a simple fact sheet that I put together. I, I had used to teach about water resources in my background and so it was a great opportunity to go through and put some basics down because I realized that many individuals didn't have the opportunity to learn some of these 
basics about water. We might take for granted that we all have a common understanding. There's a few things that I would like to point out here in the show to get to put it on the air for those of you who can't attend a listening session. And again, then uh, help you know what we're you know what we're building off of as far as a foundation in understanding water. So, like I said with our um, public trust doctrine in the state of Wisconsin, we are co-owners of water. So there isn't just the person who owns the land over the groundwater that owns what's underneath. It's all of us owning this water together, the water in our surface waters, the water in our, that includes our lakes and our streams, the water in our um, groundwater that is below ground. The water um, that we call groundwater is replenished through rain or snow that soaks into the ground and it percolates through the soils and rocks um, all the way to the water saturated layer below the, wa below the ground that we call the ground water table. We call it the water table. And then we have the lakes and streams <clears throat> that are connected to the groundwater. There were years past where people didn't understand that our groundwater is related to the lakes that we have in our, our communities as well or the river um, we call the Wisconsin River or the streams that are in our backyard. But Portage County is home to 100 lakes and 115 miles of streams. Plus our wetlands are plentiful here. So water is big, a big part of our story. While our aquifer, that is our, the water that's below ground, our, um, our um, aquifer is plentiful. And it is a finite resource. Many people think that it's, always, that it's unlimited, but it's not unlimited. Hence the reason why we want to do our best to, to steward the water resources in our area. <clears throat> As I said, groundwater is recharged or replenished through precipitation. We have about 32 inches of, of annual precipitation, but the majority of that precipitation naturally evaporates and all, uh, is used through, through the plant growth process and, and transpires out the leaves of green plants into the atmosphere in, as part of the water cycle. So it doesn't make it down to recharge the water table. So we have about, um, uh, um, we have about 75%, 60 to 75%, depends on where you are, that is water that doesn't make it to the water table. So. Uh, it's really important to understand that when it runs off the land and downstream, down the river, it isn't available to recharge our, our groundwater. The majority of people in our, our community depend on, um, well, first of all, more than 70% of Wisconsin's drinking water and essentially all of Portage County's drinking water comes from groundwater. And about 40% of our citizens in Portage County get their drinking water from private wells. When we pump our water out of our wells in our, in our, in our homes, like I do in the rural parts of our county, then I di we discharge the water through our septic system, and that's returned to the groundwater. So that is as close to a cyclical system as you can get. When we tap, um, we turn on the tap of a municipal water system like in the city of Stevens Point, after we uh, flush it down the toilet or it goes down the drain, that water goes through a water treatment process and then goes downstream by and large. Most of it goes downstream, down the river, uh, outside of our whole area. So we lose it to our system here. Again, hence the reason why you want to make sure that you're being conscious about replenishing your water table. Because you can, if you don't have enough precipitation to replenish it and you flush it downstream, then uh, what are you going to do over time if, if um, you haven't gotten enough rain to recharge that water table? The average person uses about 50 gallons of water a day. And as I mentioned before, water and economic development are, are related here, are integral to our um, community's vibrancy here and what attracts people and, and helps us uh, ensure jobs here in Portage County. It's, it's because we have water, on a, a secure water system, I would say, here in Portage County. There are over a thousand high capacity wells in Portage County. Those are wells, most of which are used for agriculture, but high cap wells are also used in our municipal water systems and we even have some in our county parks like at Lake Emily. We um, withdrew the most groundwater of any county in the state of Wisconsin in 2011, 2012, and 2013. Figures are showing the same. 
And it's again because we have a great um, use through our agricultural industry in particular. We, that's the greatest um, uh, quantity of water uh, in, in a pie chart when you show the use of the water that's pumped out of high cap wells, most of it is used for agricultural uh, purposes. Um, different crops use different amounts of water and irrigation technologies such as drip, drip, drip nozzles and, moil, uh, and um, soil moisture sensors are, um, are technologies that help us manage water in farm fields and uh, growers are working very hard to manage their water in that way. All right, so these are some of the aspects related to groundwater. A lot of that is about use and quantity, but I do want to say a few words about quality of our water as well. We know that our aquifer, as plentiful as it is, has a really awesome quality here in central Wisconsin, and it's one of the reasons many of us live here. The quality is really important, though, as there are appropriate health standards for various chemicals in the water and uh, non-naturally occurring substances in the water. About 30% uh, of Portage County's wells tested show that there are pesticide contaminants in those waters. Our coarse soils here in much of Portage County and cent the Central Sands area, which is a portion of about eight counties in the central part of Wisconsin that have well-drained soils, um, are, are soils that make it such that what you put on the surface of the, the, the soil can pass through quickly through all the um, inner uh, spaces of those uh, in between the particles of the soils and flush to the, to the water table. And that's one of the reasons why taking better care of what we do on the surface is a really important part of ensuring water quality for our future. Nitrates is the most common contaminant in Portage County water as well as in uh, waters as a contaminant uh, in the state of Wisconsin. Low concentrations are naturally occurring, that's uh, less than 0.2 parts per million of nitrate, and values greater than that are an indication of contamination from human activities, such as fertilizer, animal waste, septic systems, sewage treatment plants, um, decaying plant matter, and so on. The state and federal limits Maximum allowable levels for nitrate nitrogen in public drinking water is 10 parts per million. And um, high nitrate levels of, in our drinking water pose risks to infants as well as to pregnant women. Also, there's evidence that suggests that adults with heart and lung disease and enzyme defects or cancer may be more sensitive to the toxic effects of nitrate and, other, and that nitrates may increase the risk of certain cancers. So we're talking about an importance of ensuring our quality of water to combine with ensuring our future and quantity of water so that together we put that into our action strategies for our county and we ensure that for decades and decades and decades to come, the people will be proud of the decisions we made to steward the water resources forever here and um, central Wisconsin will stay a place that people want to live, can live, and will um, continue to grow food for, for a, a good part of our nation and our, our world. So that's the groundwater story. Again, I hope to see you on January 13th at the listening session at 6 o'clock in the Pineries Room of the Library. Then after this final listening session, what I'm going to do with uh, the staff that's helping me here from the Planning and Zoning Department and my own office, we're going to go ahead and put together a written report that will be shared on February 4th in the County Annex building, building on the first floor at 6.30 p.m., that report will also be available online and you'll be able to find out what did we all talk about in these, um, these listening sessions around the county here in Portage County. I know that there are other counties looking to us to learn what we're doing. They say that they're behind. They want to kind of catch up on stewarding water resources and they're looking to what we're learning here and having discussions about in Portage County. So that's kind of exciting. At the same time as I know, we've got a lot of state attention and actually national attention on what's going on related to stewarding water resources here. We're going in the right direction. I'm excited about the numbers of people and the stakeholders that have come together to talk about this resource um, opportunity before us. And um, 
I have no doubt that we're going to keep marching in the right direction when it comes to water. Thank you everybody for listening to the groundwater section of the show and what I'd like to do now is to turn attention and welcome Kate Kipp, our Justice Programs Director. Thank you. Thank you for welcoming me. Yes, you've been on staff for about three months now. Correct. And I'm very excited to have had the opportunity to appoint you, stealing you from Marathon County, by the way. That you did. Sorry, Marathon <laughs> County, but anyway. Anyway, Kate, um, what we're going to talk about today is a little bit more about where do you come from in your own field of expertise, and let's teach the viewers about justice programs. Where's the, what, what's the leading edge here, and what's Portage County working on related to uh, criminal justice programs, Excellent. especially for adults, but we'll touch a little bit on kids, too. So I think that's pretty important for folks to know about. It is. So start with a little bit about yourself. Um, as you said, I have come to you from Marathon County. I worked in Marathon County Social Services beginning in 2003 as an advanced practice social worker. Um, my first three years with the county, I worked in child protective services assessments. Um, and then my last uh, eight years of service there was in the juvenile justice system. Wow. So, all right. So you've got this experience behind you, and now you come to Portage County. It's interesting. You know, you applied to come here. You, you, you uh, um you know something about what's going on in Portage County before you submitted your application. What, what do others think about Portage County when it comes to justice? In my research, when I mm -hmm, applied, mm -hmm. there's so much energy that surrounds Portage County, even in um, talking about the water. Like, there, when there are questions being asked, sometimes it's Portage County that's asking them first. Um, and there's also something very unique here in the Justice Coalition, um, which is a very... Um, dynamic group of community stakeholders who are coming together um, and regularly asking the questions, what are we doing that works? What else can we do and how can we innovate? Uh, which is just wonderful to see judges, attorneys, education, therapists, um, people in the recovery committee, community all coming together um, to mm -hmm. solve problems. Yeah, I, I have been always excited about and impressed by our Justice Coalition, how they're, they're working together, recognizing that the, the justice system is just that. It is a system. If you make one change over here, you, you tinker with the whole system, and you better be ready to understand what the other uh, ripple effects are and make sure that we make the right decision in the first place. Absolutely, and it's been interesting yeah. as I've talked with people who talk about life before the Justice Coalition and how one small change in one department and all of a sudden a whole cascade of unintended events happened and now that the Justice Coalition is in place, those things have largely stopped because everybody comes to the table, they talk about the whole map um, and then make changes together. So we have a number, let's just maybe hit on those work groups as uh, how the Justice Coalition does its work. Uh, everybody may May not know this and by the way the Justice Coalition holds meetings that are open to the public so it's important that if folks would like to know when the next ones are and how to how to uh, participate in those meetings we can make sure that we connect everybody with that information absolutely mm -hmm. but that we do our work through the work groups correct so talk a little bit about that because you get to be the well we won't talk about cracking the whip behind those groups but what we'll do it you, you get to be the facilitator of the work groups in in moving us ahead on justice programs yes um, and we have four active work groups right now in various stages. Uh, the first work group that we have um, is helping people with mental health um, issues in um, the Portage County Jail. Um, I was not involved in the beginning of this work group, but as the end, the question posed was, how do we support people who have mental health diagnoses in the jail? Um, that can be a time where maybe they don't have access to their medications, it's a stressful time, and wanting to make sure that we make them as safe um, and supported as possible. What the work group has come up with is a very intensive protocol that begins right when that person is booked in the Portage County Jail, identifying if they have some mental health needs. Are they seeing a therapist? Are they seeing a psychiatrist? From there, the social worker for the jail meets individually with that person to make sure that they do have all those things in place. And if they don't, they make every effort to connect them um, with medications, um, other forms of support. And then when they leave the jail, giving them kind of a roadmap of what they can do to continue to support their mental health. Wow. And I know this is such an important issue. We, we know that sometimes the criminal justice system is the place where those with mental illness get um, drawn into um, the government system because they're, they're having some other issues in their lives and it kind of shows up when they uh, unfortunately violate a law. Mm -hmm. 
And aren't, are we also in that group working to divert them in the first place? Uh, it, do you have any knowledge of what's happening there? At this point, we're just focusing on the protocol, but I okay. also think that that's going to be a further discussion as we look at the jail overcrowding work group mm -hmm. um, and then possibly the implementation of treatment courts down the line. Wonderful. Thank you. So that's the first work Correct. group. Talk about the other ones, Kate. Uh, the second one would be what we call the warrants work group. And what that is for, um, for a group of people who have very overdue forfeitures, a warrant can be issued. Um, and why we're looking at that is in terms of the, the jail space in Portage County is a premium. And is this a wise use of our jail space? So we're just looking at the whole, um, the whole system because I will say the clerk of court's office uses every exhaustive technique to try to get these monies. So if I didn't pay my parking ticket, for example, Something like that? Um, like a disorderly a conduct. Okay, got um, it. Something like that. And it, time goes by and they've called you, they've sent you postcards, sure. all kinds of things, and you just refuse to pay that. Eventually, and I understand that there are some people that they don't even have enough money to pay as it is, no matter what. Correct. So then they're just sitting their time in, in jail, and that's costing the taxpayers dollars. So it, it is. It's a, something that taking this system's view on is a really important element in, in helping us manage our tax dollars wisely going forward. It is. Yeah. So how about the other groups? Uh, the other group mm -hmm. I previously mentioned was jail overcrowding. Jail overcrowding. Um, as we know, mm -hmm. in Portage County, there's currently a lot of conversation of do we or do we not build a jail? Regardless of what that answer is, we have a jail that's very, very full, and we're also putting inmates in uh, neighboring county jails because there's not the ability to keep them here. So are there things that we can do right now in terms of looking at that whole system that would help alleviate some of that efficiencies? One of the things uh, that's being discussed is our circuit court judges are currently changing the way that they schedule cases. They are hoping that this one way of doing things may f make the system go a little bit faster. And if you're sitting in jail right now awaiting uh, a plea hearing or a sentencing, maybe that would go faster and help with that. There's also bigger things. Do we look at home monitoring um, for certain people? Do they need to be in jail? Or can they be at home on a home monitoring program? Um, again, alleviating some of that. And in terms of pretrial diversion, which you brought up with people who may not be appropriate for jail, mm -hmm. are there more things that we can do to support them, make sure our community is safe? And hold them accountable. Absolutely. And at the same time, provide some extra oversight, I guess I would call Correct. it. Correct. Without having to necessarily use the jail. I have to tell you, um, Kate, it was a really interesting meeting this week when we attended the executive committee of the Justice Coalition. This is a, a committee, actually, I suggested that we start for your predecessor to provide some extra oversight in between Justice Coalition meetings to get a key group of stakeholders together and sort of populate that agenda for the Justice Coalition through Judge Flugar, but at the same time to provide additional uh, discussion time as the Justice Programs Director moves through the work. This is a lot of work. But anyway, the reason I wanted to bring that up right now is you helped to trigger that for me by talking about the jail overcrowding uh, work group. We wanted to, um, we want to better understand who is in our jail. And as much as the public might think that's an easy question to, to answer, it is not, and you are bringing some very interesting data to share with us about that. Is there anything else you would want to say as you go through the process? It's not about the detail that, because you don't, we don't even have the detail quite yet, but it's about trying to gather and get at that. So if we know who is in our jail, whether they have mental illness, whether they are there for these classification of breaking the law kinds of, of, um, of, um, uh, conditions and, and reasons, then we can maybe do something different about addressing the scooting of them through the system quicker so that we don't have to pay so much and they don't have to spend so long in a jail situation, yet dealing with what they have to deal with when it comes to their court conditions. Right. And I think what's interesting is making sure when we understand who is in the jail is who has to stay in the jail yes. and who can we look at from a different point of view. Um, and I think that's part of that was we've stirred up those questions um, in people because I think sometimes there's an assumption that if you're in jail, you have to be there. And I don't think that's not always necessarily true. And there are a lot of different actuarial assessments out there to help us look based upon completing these. Are you someone that with 
oversight and some additional help that you could also be safe for coming back and staying at home mm -hmm. again with certain conditions um, versus staying in jail and losing connection um, I think sometimes we forget that when people go to jail they often lose jobs they lose access to treatment they lose access to their natural community supports um, so if you're there and maybe you're one of those people that based upon an assessment you would be low risk and could come into our community you now don't have your job um, and you've lost connections with your kids and there's a whole cascade again of events that that occur and burdens on taxpayers and Correct. other you know other buckets I guess you would say yes. whether it's over in social services or or somewhere else so mm -hmm. uh, or on some unemployment um, or, or some such sure. other taxpayer supported um, service I guess you would say yes so important okay so let's let's continue on with the groups that we, you're working with the treatment court mm -hmm. let's talk about that because we're gonna go to uh, observe a drug court and, uh, just after the show today we are I think that this group is just exhilarating um, treatment courts have been around um, since 1989 when the first one um, was formed in Miami Miami-Dade County in Florida and what happened in 1989 was similar to the questions that are happening here like this just isn't working we're seeing people come in be prosecuted be sentenced time goes by and they're right back in with new charges we've got to do something to help change the thinking process of people uh, and create lasting change versus just incarcerating um, Wisconsin um, has picked up on this and I will say this the entire country has really professionalized what treatment courts look like there are standards there are rigorous um, ways to implement them so that they are holding people accountable mm -hmm creating community safety and people are still getting treatment um, so this work group is saying how can we maybe implement that here in Portage County we know that there is a drug problem here in Portage County and we know that we also have problem with um, drinking and driving in Portage County and we also know statistics tell us that necessarily just going to jail or prison doesn't really reroute that thinking so what treatment courts do is you um, it, just speaking in general you would be sentenced to participate in a treatment court now usually in a regular court you're sentenced and you go on and that's it you don't come back before your judge in a treatment court you're gonna come back to treatment court every week and during that week you will have maybe five or six different urinalysis tests breathalyzers you're gonna to go to group therapy you are gonna to go to individual therapy you're gonna participate in um, a job or community service and then you're gonna be held accountable by that judge on that day and what's also unique is that judge who you're in front of is made a decision with your entire treatment team and and with this these are this is a proven evidence-based yes, practice so as it's been refined over time it's a great next step for us in Portage County I want to make sure because we have about a minute left in the okay. show that we let everybody um, hear from you your your what's on the exciting frontier for Portage County do you think when it comes to our next steps under your leadership I think the next steps are looking at utilizing all this new research that's out there in terms of trauma-informed care evidence-based practice and using that to really guide us versus something that just feels good or sounds good saying this is what the rest of the country is doing with great success let's model it here and make it work for our citizens and we are leaders in this field of justice Correct. so it's so exciting I'm looking forward to what's new what's next under your leadership in combination with the Justice Coalition and other stakeholders of our community that care about moving people through and um, having our community be safer and healthier overall Thank you for being here today, well, Kate. You're welcome. Thank you. Next show, we're going to have Sarah Brish with us, the, the Executive Director of the Stevens Point Area Visitor and Convention Bureau. I promised you the after action on the Farm Technology Days, and we're going to talk about other really awesome mobile apps and other services that are going on through the CVB. So I'll see you then. Thanks for joining us.